they still eat meat. What I really want to do is eat cow. All right. So this this gives you an idea that there are people who come out and say, "I'm into polyamory" or "I'm into BDSM," but what they do and and how they what they want to do is completely different. And you just need to keep that in mind as we go through this. Okay. So people have either a mono or a poly identity, all right? Um, and again, the identity is not the behavior, and it's not the orientation, but it is the identity. So people will say, I'm monogamous, all right? I'm, I just want one person, all right? In reality, that's not what they want, all right? But there are social conventions and partner imperatives and all sorts of other things that lead people to say, this is who I am, all right? What's interesting when you look at the ads, the personal ads, where people are looking for BDSM relationship, the first thing and probably the most common reason people are rejected is because they say, I'm poly or I'm mono and I, that's what I say, all right? And anyone, no matter how good a fit you are, if you say I'm the other, terribly sorry, take care, I know we had a good time talking, I'm not interested anymore. Very interesting. Um, some people see monogamy as an idea. You know, if I was truly in love, and if this person was truly my soulmate, and if, 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 then. I would just need that one person and that would be perfectly happy and I'm not looking for anyone else. But since that hasn't happened, I'm still looking for other people. Um, in BDSM, we're going to talk about it. sometimes the monogamy is only for one partner or there's no choice in the partner for one of the people because we'll get to what BDSM is there's a power dynamic. I, I make this distinction about <coughs> play partners versus relationships. There are a lot of, quote, monogamous relationships where they're allowed to go out and have, in essence, friends with benefits or maybe one-time sex with people that they pick up, but it's, but it's not a relationship. It's not someone they're committed to. And sometimes we get into, I don't want to argue sorry, about alpha, beta, but sometimes there's picking ones. Um, you can go on to the next one. BDSM, bondage and discipline, dominance and submission, sadism and masochism, also called kiki, what it is that we do, and <laughs> many, many, many subtypes. And there are people who do BDSM because eh, it's kind of fun once in a while, but they'll say very clearly, it's in the bedroom, it's not what I, it's not my lifestyle, I don't want it to be my lifestyle. We're not talking about that. We're talking about people who want and say, BDSM is an integral part of who I am, and I want that, that part of me in the lifestyle. Next. Now, I should point out that it is impossible to do a talk on BDSM without offending someone. <laughs> and everyone will say, oh my God, how could you not put my type of relationship up? How could that be? And so I apologize now before we go any further that that was all I could fit on this slide. All right? And if I have offended anyone, I'm serious, I really apologize. Each one of these different categories is a very special, different type of BDSM relationship. And if you ask some of these people, would you be interested in, in a different type of relationship, they would say no. Right? Now I should point out that when I first started doing uh, research, there were two groups in, in the community. There were what was called the B&D, bondage and discipline, and 
and he has an emmer. All right, say this is a master. And each of the groups said, those other people are crazy. They're <laughs> bad. All right? Well, I'm just trying to do good research, and I would try and devise questionnaires and interviews that would tell them the difference. You know, these BDSMers are like this, and these SMers are like this, and that's the difference. And guess what? They've never found the difference, and eventually the groups came together. They do have commonality uh, themselves. I'm going to talk a lot about some of these, and if we have time, I can talk about a lot of them. But each of them has a different um, flavor to them. But the bottom line is, they're still, in, they're still part of the BDSM spectrum. And BDSM is uh, a consensual power exchange relationship. Next. Now, to make it into my discussion of BDSM and polyamory, you have to meet both definitions. Right? So you can't just be into BDSM and occasionally have a couple of relationships. You can't be a polyamorous person and occasionally do BDSM. Both those styles have to be meshed together. And when I first started uh, doing this, people said, well, there's nobody like that. No, most people don't exist. BDSM is too um, intense to have polyamory. And the polyamorous people said, Oh no, we're so egalitarian, we could not possibly <laughs> allow BDSM. That's what they said. All right, yes. So, I try, so I, this is again, not real data, but more of a, what are the commonalities and the differences? And the commonalities, obviously, multiple significant relationships. Uh, people tend to have discretion with others. Comes BDSM polyamory, is kind of um, on the edge, even for these other communities. People don't always broadcast. Now, there aren't clearly exceptions to that. There are lots of people who are very upfront about it. But there's a lot of people who really aren't. There are love um, relationships involved in both. Um, rules and contracts are at least in the beginning of all these relationships in the BDSM part, usually um, the rules continue, they may change, but they continue. <coughs> Contracts tend to fall away with time. There's clearly commitment. And I think most people in these relationships would say it needs to grow. So let's talk about the differences. And this, this act always seems to amaze me. You find some uh, BDSM relationship, and uh, and you're talking to them, and the guy goes, "You want to play with my partner?" And you go, well, "It's kind of cute." And he says, "Well, I want you to know that our rules are, you know, you can cane her and spank her and call her, you know, slut. No sexual intercourse." Now, I just want to stop for a second and think about that. Here's a person you love, all right? And it's okay for you to beat her. It's not okay for you to make love with her or have sex with her or give her an orgasm. That's the rule. Now, of course, that's not true of all these relationships. But it's more, much more common to find people who say, you can do uh, sex with my partner. I'm oh, sorry, you can do BDSM with my partner, but not sex than sex with my partner, not being the same. It's a very interesting dynamic, something I want to study more. And because BDSM is a um, power uh, relationship, there, it leads itself to having a pecking order. And you'll find the submissive partner in the relationship is very clear that even though I'm submissive to that person, I'm going to be dominant to that person or no, I want that person to be dominant with me, right? Occasionally you want them, though you'll hear people saying, we, I want both of us to be, let's say some kind of whole sister slave or brother slave, where we're all at the same level. But more often there's a pecking order. Now in poly relationships, jealousy happens. 
but there are mechanisms to deal with this. In BDSM, jealousy happens and it's often exploited, all right, as part of the power exchange. And of course, the difference is uh, there's a focus on control, which may not exist in the, I, I, I was trying to remember a better term for this, but I'm gonna call it traditional power. It's, uh, <laughs> uh, but what we normally think of in the, the people who are writing about poly um, relationships, there's a difference in, in, in that level of control. Next. And in the BDSM community, there's clearly levels of commitment and commitment is shown in all these different ways. People get colored. Color is something like a um, uh, getting a, a ring um, in a marriage or an engagement. Some people are more um, the new age and they do hand casting. People are often treated uh, or branded, peers branded in some sort of theoretically permanent way. By the way, none of those are really permanent. They Done. Um, often they will have marriage involved because it's really convenient in this society to be married to something. Right? So it's not necessarily that they think, oh my god, that's, you know, I'm, I'm looking for an MRS, but it's that fault. So, uh, this is. This is great. Oh, it's the radiation. What's your hand passing? Hand fasting is a thing where, um, sort of pagan uh, thing where people, you know, grab their hands with a ribbon or a rope is wrapped around it as a sign of their commitment and open display in front of the uh, community that these two people are together. At least two. I'm sorry? At least two. At least. At least two. I forget where I was, sorry. <laughs> Bisexual woman joining a couple has been called the unicorn. And I, I once saw an ad from somebody, a couple, who said, and if you happen to be a bisexual woman interested in a couple, we will arrange for the birds to sing, the heavens to part. <laughs> I, I just went on, on and on about how, how wonderful that would be if we could finally find someone like that. Now, we're going to talk about cuckolding, which is a special type of BDSM relationship in a minute. But the woman in that um, relationship, it's usually two men and a woman, though, not all the time. The woman in that relationship is the one that is hard to find. You can go online and find easily hundreds of ads from cuckold, not a problem. The bull, which is the other guy who's going to have sex with the woman, 
No problem. Lots of, <laughs> lots of guys are volunteering. But to find a woman who wants that relationship, that is apparently very difficult. And you actually find lots of, of ads on the, I'm on, I'm actually on the call. Um, uh, you actually find lots of ads of people who say uh, things like, would you, you know, I'd like to meet you, I'd like to have this relationship, I want my cuckoo, I really want to help. Could you seduce my wife, please? All right? That's, that's sort of the level that they're at because of um, uh, these people are so hard to find. Um, the last couple, the last unicorn, are a submissive, submissive couple. And these are really tough, not because it doesn't exist. I mean, you can find lots of people say, oh yeah, we're a couple, we're both submissive, and we're both looking for something. Um, but in reality, once you uh, start the approach, their interest falls away. And it usually falls away because it's really hard to find uh, someone who can be all things to the couple that they're looking for. So very quickly, it's sort of like, Oh no, I don't do this, oh no, I don't do that. Uh, not about this, but slightly different. I, in my very early part of my research, it was very hard to find women who would admit to being into BDSM. And in my research, I found two women who both said to me, I really want to meet another woman who's into BDSM. So I said, okay, this sounds good. So I invited them both to dinner, and <laughs> it seems like reasonable. <laughs> Honest, this was complete research, and I honestly did not think I would have done ever. So they come, and they, they come to dinner, and I figured the nice thing to do is introduce them, and then go into the kitchen and make dinner. And five minutes later, one of the women is at the is in the kitchen talking to me. And I said, "Wait a minute, what about you know out there? You want to meet another one?" And she sort of sighs and says. You know that I'm really into all the physical stuff and not into any of the psychological stuff. And that woman's only into the psychological stuff and none of the physical stuff, and we have absolutely nothing to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> now, so these couples, and they come in various forms, and so there's uh, dominant, dominant couples, and these couples get together and they're fall in love the way anyone else does, and they're a couple, and usually somewhere down the, the road of being a couple, they both come to the realization that they're really more into the dominant side of the USM, and they recognize that the other person's really not there, and so they often develop other relationships on the outside, and uh, one person can be a switch, meaning they can play both parts, sometimes both are switches, and sometimes they take turns. You know, he says, look, I know you really want to do this, so do it to me. Right. Um, but they eventually sort of say, maybe we could find our own submissive person that we could share. Next. And then the dominant submissive couples, and again, there are many, many ways that this gets presented. It's not a simple thing. Um, and sometimes, it's the dominant wants to see the submissive person with others. It's a real power trip, I think you can imagine, if the one person can say, you're gonna have sex with that person without giving that person any choice, all right? And the person who has no choice really likes it that they don't have choice. Uh, and then there's a whole bunch of other feelings that go into this. Uh, Forced to be bisexual, not because they're really turned on by the same sex or the other sex, but because it's a power trip. Humiliation in one form or another. Humiliation is one of those terms that there's not a good BDSM term to describe what it is. It's not humil it's not humiliating in the way we normally think of it in general society. Objectification is being used as an object versus um, a person, no one, I mean, it, I'm sure it's someone who's completely objectified, but in general, it's 
again, as a way of reinforcing the power dynamic and loss of control is often very erotic to uh, these individuals. And again, the submissive-submissive couples who often start out as a DS couple and uh, over time, the usual, uh, one of the ways that happens in the scene that people know about uh, 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 the image or the story of Anne, people know that? In 1950s, there were two novels that, are so, that uh, discussed BDSM in great time. One was the story of O, which I'm sure most people know. Did you know that? Yeah, okay. And the other was um, uh, the image, which also came out as the story, as, um, uh, the story of Anne. And in this, it's a dominant woman who is partnered with a submissive woman. And what she's doing in this process, she involves this other guy, is she's training the guy to be dominant, all right? And then sort of the final scene of the movie is her showing up at his door and through a variety of cues is letting him know that she's submissive to him. To people in that scene, that's a very erotic concept. Um, there is a great concern in these submissive, submissive couples that they're going to be broken up and there are often rules about that. Um, and people have very uh, interesting takes of why they prefer to be in submissive, submissive couples versus what, um, uh, splitting up and each having their own. Now the male submissive partner is particularly interesting because it violates so many of the social norms, right? And it gets actualized by relationships where the male submissive never has insertive sex. Insertive meaning his penis in somebody else. Um, there's often an issue of feminization, humiliation, uh, chastity or lack of choice of who they're going to have sex with. But very interestingly, physical punishment is not uncommon. Meaning there are, there are these relationships where we think of BDSM as somebody gets tied up and spanked, whipped, uh, caned, whatever. In these relationships, that happens less often. Not never, but less often. Very interesting. Next. Now, there is a bias in some of the research I do about um, heterosexual, heterosexuality or bisexuality. But the LGBT community has their own set of norms around this, and they're not necessarily completely different, but they're um, actualized somewhat differently. Um, it's not always about people who identify as gay or bi. Right? Yes, I'm in this relationship, and yes, I'm having sex with all these you know, same-sex people, uh, but that's not who I am. You know, it's just part of it. There's a lot of um, sense that the BDSM is much more important than, who the, than the sex of the person I'm uh, involved in. And there's another argument around orientation that maybe BDSM is its own orientation and not just the behavior. Um, and um, I want to talk about cuckolding because I, I've been fascinated with cuckolding. And people say, why are you so fascinated with it? And it's the only relationship I know where there are three separate roles that are not interchangeable. Even, you know, if you think about a, a triad, you know, it's like two men or two women and somewhere else, people can sort of interact with each other in pretty much the same way, you know, uh, 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 without, you know, there's some relationship issues, but pretty much the sex is the same. Not in couple. It is almost unheard of for the cuckold to have sex the way the wolf has sex with the woman. Now there's a different concept 
for um, what's called cup queening, which is a woman who wants her partner, male partner, to have sex with another woman. And very clearly, um, the cup queens are very clear that it's really hard to find a woman who's gonna have sex with her partner and also do this sort of dominance, humiliation thing with her. And often it also seems like, you know, I'm prettier than you, I'm, uh, she likes me more than you, there's a whole bunch of that sort of rolled in. This is a, um, another area that is not well studied. Um, and when you look at the, uh, these relationships, the people say, it's hard to find a bull who understands this dynamic, who knows how to intercede. And sometimes the dynamic is very, um, uh, very elaborate in the sense that um, the bull is given the keys to the house and is supposed to come and go as he pleases. Uh, sometimes the bull will have, uh, will father a child with the, with the woman, leaving the, the cuckold and the woman to raise the child. There's an awful lot of issues in here about race with so there's a whole bunch of, of taboos all rolled into one. Um, the hot wife and the woman in the relationship can be dominant or submissive. People, for a long time, people didn't think that she could be submissive, but we now have enough data to show that it happens with some regularity. And that she wants to be dominant to her partner, male partner, but the bull is someone that she wants to have be uh, either submissive to or on the egalitarian relationship. Um, so let me go on to the next one. Uh, and cucks come, or the last uh, uh, discussion was someone identified 10 different forms of, of cucks, of what they want and how they approach uh, these relationships. Very clear though that the cuck wants a very close, loving relationship with his um, cuck wife or cuck holders. And there's a whole bunch of stuff there about racial stereotypes. There's always about he's more uh, attractive. They want, there's something about large organs. You know, if you don't have 10 inches, don't call us. Uh, next. And just as a point, cuckolding is a uh, misnomer, and the correct term is, is uh, withholding. Withholding, the difference is that withholds know that their partner's having sex with others, cuckolds don't, but you can't change that. Um, uh, a lot of issues with um, chastity, smoking is humiliation, I can't satisfy my wife or my girlfriend, and What's most interesting, you find cases where men uh, are in a relationship, this is what they want to do, and they realize that they're having sex with this woman and she's kind of satisfied and the relationship's going on, it's not what he wants. So they learn, they teach themselves to be premature ejaculators, to lose their erection during sex, and then sort of say to the woman, I really think you should find someone, you know, someone else, I still love you, I want to be with you, but I really want you to develop another relationship that's going to be sexually satisfying to you because uh, I can't do it. And they sort of try and manipulate the situation. I think that's fascinating. Next. Uh, so, uh, I'm supposed to finish in about three minutes, about three or nine, so I <laughs> This is who I am. Feel free to email me. Um, can we get to the next? Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. I'm ready for questions. I'm ready for questions. This, just let me say, this is the, the BDSM flag, the poly flag, a poly uh, symbol, a BDSM symbol. This is a cup holding symbol. I told you I'm very interested in it. There, He's wearing a uh, chastity uh, device. 
she's holding the key to the lock, and uh, so he can't have sex, and this is the uh, bull having sex with the wife. And people, people wear t-shirts like this, saying, this is what I want, and then great minds do fuck each other. I'm sorry, question. I'm curious what your thoughts are on the interaction of hierarchies, such as polyamorous hierarchies, like primary, secondary, tertiary, versus BDSM hierarchies, like master, dominant, top. Um, a lot of the poly hierarchy, uh, I think over time, fall away, right? But I think the BDSM hierarchies get more entrenched. I think that is a distinction. So, in other words, you start off, I'm, you know, uh, I'm alpha and she's beta and, you know, whatever. And over time, people are people, they develop their own relationships, and the alpha beta distinction blurs. In BDSM, if anything, it gets more intense. Now, that doesn't mean that people don't change. In other words, I started off being really submissive to her, but now I'm really dumb in her and submissive to this other one, and, you know, so it can change. But the nature of BDSM polyamory is some sort of power differential in all the relationships, all the intimate relationships. To lead the question one step further, what happens when you have a primary and a master that have an opposing opinion about what the person in the middle should be doing? You have like a V situation, You've got a primary on one side and a master on the other side. So you have a top tier of hierarchy, but in a different category, somehow opposed. So you're, we're talking about, just to put sex to it, two dominant men with a submissive woman? Sure, okay. one example. All right, there's, um, uh, in those situations, it's often we talk about um, uh, married but dominated by another, all right? And usually there are ground rules set up in the relationship to sort of define, you know, what areas are what. I, as you know, I'm a physician. I see a lot of um, BDSM couples in my, in my practice. And sometimes, and this is always out of good nature, so I want to be clear about that. The dominant in the relationship says, I don't think she should be taking this medicine. All right? And we have a discussion about it, obviously. But at some point, I need to be as a physician say, you can top her all you want. I'm running the medicine, okay? What I, you know, I mean, she has some rights, and you have some rights, and I can't force anyone to take, um, you know, take medicine, I don't want to. But your fears about that, all right? I mean, I'm only listening to do data. But your fears about it, and you're trying to control that, when you don't have the training for it, is inappropriate. Almost all the time, they back down. All right, so, but it, that is sort of the, uh, uh, there are ground rules around that. And so it, sometimes it's enough to break up the relationship, but I don't really see that very often. More questions? I'm interested in, you talked about the commonalities and differences. And you talked about one of the differences being about jealousy is expected and exploited in these relationships. So I'm wondering like, um, if that is something that's uh, part of a scene or if you think that happens in general amongst the community. Um, um, you know, I, first of all, those are tough terms to define what is jealousy, all right? But there's an awful lot of um, issues with the person being um, uh, the submissive person having fears of loss, having fears that the person's going to leave, that their their close relationship between the two of them is somehow threatened, that she's more interested in the new guy now. Uh, and some, to some extent, that's not only expected, but they intensify it a bit because it adds to the humiliation and the uh, submissive nature of the relationship. Uh, just to give you a historical thing, Sager Masak, who became masochism after was married, was an, was an Austrian novelist, and he would send his wife out to have sex with other men. 
And when he would do that, he would say to her as she's leaving, I am so jealous of you. Now she didn't really want to go. She was just doing it to please him. But it was that concept of being jealous because the other person was going to uh, have something that he didn't feel he could have. Um, we're out of time. We have another event starting in here right now. And you were scheduled to do this talk upstairs starting right now. And there are a lot of people coming upstairs thinking that that's actually what's going to happen. Would you like that to be so? <laughs> uh, or just take this conversation upstairs for anybody who wants to continue it and continue it up in 2D. So you would like to do it together or yourself or you need to do it? You have every option available. Well, if you, uh, if you guys are doing it, then I'm happy for you guys to do it. I actually need to get back to the hospital, so I'm probably not going to do that. And I'll, um, so, uh, I'm going to uh, step out at this point.